You're about to discover the six things that you really need to know and watch out for if you're thinking of cruising in Europe with Viking River Cruises. Hi, I'm Gary Bemidge and this is another of my tips for travellers. I'm just back from a European river cruise along the Danube with Viking on the Viking William. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to share with you the things that I wish I'd known and the things that I learned to help you better understand a Viking river cruise in Europe and the things to really watch out for and make sure that you're aware of before you go. It was actually established back in 1997, so it's not the oldest river cruising company, but it is a very large company. It has over 70 ships at the time of recording, either on the rivers or about to enter the rivers, and they're constantly expanding. It operates in the premium end of river cruising, so it's not on the ultra luxury end, it's in the premium end. Secondly, in Europe, Viking operate what are known as the Viking longships. Now, these longships operate on most of the rivers in Europe, there are a couple of rivers where the longships are too big to operate on, so they have a scaled down version. Let me tell you a little bit about what you can expect on a Viking longship. It has 190 passengers and around about 45 crew, so a very high crew to passenger ratio. When you step on board the longship, the first thing you'll notice is the decor. It's very Scandinavian in look and feel, and that of course links back to the original heritage and the founders who come from Scandinavia. There are four different accommodation types on board. There are two suites, which are at the rear of the long ships. They then have a veranda suite, which has an actual balcony which you can go out and it has a table and two chairs. They also have veranda cabins, which have floor to ceiling windows, but these are Juliet balconies, so there's no actual balcony you can step out on. And then on the lower level, they have standard cabins, which have a small window at the top of the cabin. And that's because these cabins are partly below the water level. On the top deck, you have the sun deck, which is a big open space where you can sit out and enjoy the weather and the scenery. On the next level down, you have the real heart and hub of the ship, which is the lounge. This is where you have the bar. It's also where you will have your daily briefings. It's where people meet during the day. They go for drinks before and after dinner. It's where if there's any entertainment, it'll also be hosted here. In the front of the lounge is what's known as Aquavit. And so you'll also have the early riser breakfast out here and you will have you know, a lighter breakfast, a lighter lunch. And in the evening, you can actually dine here and it's the same menu as in the main restaurant. To the rear of the lounge, you have the 24 hour tea and coffee making facilities, which are great. There's also on this level a small library and a couple of computers if you haven't brought your own laptop. On the level below that you have the reception area and a small Viking shop which sells branded merchandise and other products related to the cruise. Then you have the dining room. This is a great open space. Everyone can sit here. It's open seated dining. You have breakfast, lunch and dinner. Breakfast is buffet, although they do have an eggs cooking station. You can order things like pancakes and eggs benedict. Lunch is a buffet, there'll often be a pasta station, and again, you can order from a menu. The evening, it's a full multi-course dinner menu where you'll have a regional menu based on where you're cruising through, a la carte, and then some standards which are on every single day. What's as important as what the ship does have is what it doesn't have. So there's no medical center on board, and that's true of all river cruising boats because you're close enough to the banks and ports to not have medical centers. Also, Viking, unlike some other River Cruise Companies, it doesn't have a fitness center, it doesn't have a spa, it doesn't have a hairdresser, it doesn't have an exercise room, it doesn't carry bicycles. The focus of the longship is very much on the sort of the hotel experience, the dining experience, and very much around the destinations and the excursions. The third thing to know about Viking is they offer you an enormous choice of rivers and also even itineraries on those rivers. Because they have such a big fleet in operation, they have huge permutations. You're likely to find pretty much any of the rivers in Europe that you want to sail on, Viking are there. So for example, they sail on the Danube, the Rhine, the Rhone, the Elbe, the Moselle, the Douro, the Volga, the waters of Bordeaux. They sail on rivers in Holland and Belgium. But even on those rivers, there's lots of different itineraries. So as you look at the rivers that you want to go on, there's going to be different itineraries. The next key thing to understand and watch out for is what is and isn't included in a Viking fare. Now, river cruising generally in Europe is pretty all-inclusive. However, there are nuances and differences based on the different brands. So what exactly 
when you look at the Viking fare, are you going to get? And this is very important because a lot of people, particularly if they're coming from ocean cruising, take a look at the river cruising fares and think they're on the high side. And that's because there's lots of stuff included. So what is included? The obvious things are included. So your accommodations included, your dinings included, and some of your drinks are also included at lunch and dinner, wine, beer, and soft drinks are included. And you'll normally find there'll be a choice of wines, obviously often a white and a red. Wi-Fi is included. Also excursions are included. So you'll find at every place you stop, there's normally at least one included excursion within your fare. Now, sometimes there will also be a choice of excursions. So you might have a choice of two or three excursions that are included. The excursions do tend to focus on the historical, the cultural, and the arts side of a destination. You will find in some of the places there are optional excursions which you do have to pay for. So for example, in Vienna, there was the opportunity to go to a classical concert in the evening. Entertainment is also included within the fair. Now, entertainment is not of the scale of an ocean cruise ship. Every evening there'll normally be one activity. Now that could be some local singers or dancers or musicians. It could be a quiz, a music quiz, or a general knowledge quiz. There's also a pianist who will play often around lunchtime, before dinner, and after dinner as well. So what is not included? First of all, gratuities are not included within the fare. And at the time of recording, the gratuities recommended were two euros per person per day for the program director and 12 euros per person per day for the rest of the crew. Drinks outside of lunch and dinner, you also have to pay for. And you can either pay for those ad hoc, or they do actually sell what's known as a Silver Spirits drinks package, which will then cover you for the entire time. Bear in mind, of course, your 24-hour teas and coffees are always available. That is included within the fare. Then if you want to do things like send stuff to the laundry, or of course you buy things in the shop, that is not included within your fare. The next important thing to understand is the passenger mix and what sort of passengers you're likely to find on board. Viking river cruises and also their ocean cruises are an adults only experience. So you have to be over 18 before you can go on a Viking river cruise. Now river cruising generally still is a slightly older traveler experience. So you're more likely to find people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and even above on river cruises, particularly in Europe. Of course you are on any cruise gonna get a variety. You're gonna find it's mostly people from the US, the UK, you'll often find a lot of Australians. It's an English language experience, so the whole program is done in English. What I also found on river cruising, and I did find this very true on Viking, is you'll find a lot of groups of people traveling together, so groups of friends or multi-generational people traveling together. So although there's lots of couples, they are often on board with friends and family. What about solo travelers? So if you're a solo traveler and you want to travel on Viking, the best thing to do is to sign up for their email newsletters or work very closely with Viking and your travel agent because what they do is certain cruises during the year will have either no single supplement or anywhere up to 50% surcharge if you're traveling in a cabin by yourself. They do tend to be cruises that are sort of the beginning of the end of the season, so less peak times. If you plan to go on a Viking river cruise or any river cruise, do you think about your degree of mobility and how active you are? The long ships do have some cabins for people with mobility issues. However, my personal opinion, river cruises are really best enjoyed by people who are a little bit more mobile because it can be quite a challenge getting on and off the long ships just because of the nature of where you're docking and the ramps. And then the places you're calling on, they're very old, traditional places. So you're gonna find lots of cobblestones, lots of stairs, and not necessarily lots of mobility-friendly ways of getting around. One thing I would say about Viking is they do go out of their way to make sure if you do have a mobility issues that they help you and work really hard to make sure you have a great cruise. There is an elevator on the long ships, but it does only go really between the two floors. So it goes between the floor of the lounge and the floor that has dining room on. Another key watch out and thing to understand is the dress code. The dress code on a Viking river cruise is pretty casual and relaxed. In fact, the only real rule that you need to bear in mind when thinking about packing and what to bring is you're not supposed to wear denim jeans or shorts in the dining room in the evening. But the rest of the dress code is pretty relaxed. Now, some people do make more of an effort and particularly in the captain's welcome party, the captain's farewell party, people dress up a bit smarter. So it's much more important to think about things like good walking shoes, layers if it gets cold or if it gets hot, so you have layers that you can layer up or down. 
things to protect you against rain if there are showers. It's much more important to think about that when it comes to thinking about your Viking River Cruise than your glad rags and your smart clothes to wear. Viking River Cruises is probably the best known river cruising company in the world and certainly within Europe. They have a very large fleet operating on lots of different rivers and they really do focus very much on the hotel and the dining and the food experience and immersing you in the places that you go to. If you're interested in Viking or you're interested in river cruising in Europe, watch many more of my Tips for Travelers videos. I have lots of videos with lots of tips about river cruising in Europe.